Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this beautiful Sunday morning? Hope you didn't get overheated yesterday. It was a blazer of a September day. But uh, we're happy you're here with us this morning. I, I just remembered I probably didn't turn on the AC, so I will be adjusting that here shortly. You did it? Sweet. So you won't be overheated this time. I know a couple weeks ago this section over here was all fanning themselves, and this section over here was fine. So I forgot to adjust that thermostat. So we got it for you guys this morning. All right, let's everybody go ahead and stand, and we're going to go ahead and get started with, uh, with worship this morning. But let's read some scripture, and then we'll pray, and then we'll dive into worship. Psalm, one, Psalm 95, 1 through 7. I love this scripture. It says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. I love this because it shows us and reminds us that our God is greater than everything else that's going on in our world around us. And in spite of what's happening in our lives, we need to come before him with praise and thanksgiving, and we need to bow before him in worship. And so let's do that this morning. Lord, we come before you with thanksgiving on our hearts. Lord, we thank you for setting us free. We thank you for seeing us 2,000 years ago when you hung on the cross. And Lord, we worship you today. Lord, be in this time of worship. Be in this time of the word. Transform our hearts today, we pray. Have your way in this service this morning, Lord. We're here to meet with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's worship God together. John 8, 34 through 36. It says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How many of you have been set free this morning from something? Worship with me this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun set. Free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace lies while I was a slave to sin. 
Thank you, Father, for making us your children. We are no longer slaves, but we are your children. And you are good to us. You may not have had an earthly father who is good to you, but your heavenly father is a good father. He loves you more than anything. And he is here for you this morning. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that i'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Call me deeper 
Spirit is really impressed on me. I'm very fortunate that I have a good relationship with my father. But I recognize that he's not perfect. He's made mistakes. And I know my husband being a father he loves his kids with everything in him. But he's not perfect. And he's made mistakes. And some of you may have had fathers who have made mistakes because they're human. But your heavenly father is pure and he is perfect. And his love for you is all-encompassing. It is the most perfect love you will ever find. And maybe your relationship with your father isn't great. But your relationship with your heavenly father can be perfect. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all. To love. We love you, Father. We love you. And we worship you this morning. We bring our worship and we lay it at your feet. That it may be a sweet, sweet sound to you. We bring it and we give it to you this morning. Without reservation. Without hesitation. With no self-consciousness. With no one, not even caring what anybody else thinks of it. We bring it to you this morning. For we love you. And the music fades. And all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song song in itself is not what you have required you 
search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus king of endless It's all about you this morning, Father. But we don't want to be in such a rush that we miss what you're trying to do in our lives right now. Let's just let's just worship him. Let's lift up our hands and just worship him in the way we know how. And let's give the Holy Spirit space right now. What in your life, what is in your world that you just need to surrender to him right now? What is he trying to do in your life right now? to our hearts right now. If God is asking you to respond to something right now, I want to encourage you to be obedient. We're going to transition to a time of prayer here in a minute. But if God is dealing with something in your life right now, respond. The altars are open.
Does somebody have a word for us this morning? I feel like God is saying something to us as a church. going to take five minutes here. We're going to take five minutes here and we're going to seek God's face. Last week we all came forward. We all took a name out of the bowl. and We prayed and cried out to God for this name. And I want to encourage you to do the same again this week. To take a step of faith and come up to the altar and grab a name and go after God for them. We're going to have other prayer requests on the, on the screen. I know the missionaries of the month are Dave and Debbie Johnson, but we're also going to pray for Doug and Christy Alley, who are here with us this morning. So lift up those two missionaries. Our kids' ministries, our youth ministries, the Henry people in Henry County, healing for the sick in our church our leadership in our country, in our city, in our state, and in our church. We're going to take five minutes of prayer, and let's go after God this morning. Why do we pray every morning, every Sunday morning? Because we see in the book of Ephesians, we see in chapter 6, the armor of God. And I'm not going to go through all the armor of God, but I want you to know that there's two things. There's only two weapons in here. One is the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. And the second is praying in the Spirit on all occasions, which is a, war, which is a, which is a way for us to actually go to battle. So it's, it's our attacking. We are attacking what the enemy is trying to do in our city when we pray. We're attacking what the enemy is trying to do in our loved one's life when we pray. The enemy doesn't want us to pray because he doesn't want us to attack him. But we need to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. We need to lift up names, lift up people who don't know Jesus. So let's spend the next five minutes crying out to God, going to warfare this morning.
us, Lord. We lift up all these names to you, Father. We cry out and we ask, Lord God, that you will be lifted high in their life. Lift, be lifted high so they can be drawn to you, Lord Jesus. For all these names in this bowls, Lord God, for all those that in our lives that don't know you, Jesus, help us to lift you high in our life so that they can be drawn to you. Help us to have the boldness to step out in faith to reach somebody who doesn't know you this week. Lord, give us a burden in our hearts for the lost. If you're sick here this morning, we'll represent someone who's sick. I'd like you to raise your hands, and we want to pray for you this morning. We want to pray for you this morning. I see those hands. I see those hands. Let's pray for Mary, who's not here with us this morning, but she needs healing. And let's pray... Uh, for all those others in our church that aren't here with us this morning, for Lana and for Karen, and I pray, let's pray for them this morning that God will touch their bodies. Oh, Holy Spirit, we come before you and we ask you for healing in every single body that's in this room that needs healing right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll relieve the back pain in Jesus' name, that you'll heal backs, that you'll heal shoulders, that you'll heal our eyes, that you'll heal all the, all the things that are inflicting on us this morning, Lord God. We come against cancer in Jesus' name. We rebuke cancer this morning. In Jesus' name, you see, cancer, you must die in these bodies. Lord, we pray for health in every single body in this place, Lord God. We cry out to you, Lord we, Jesus, just speak the word so that they can be healed. We cry out to you this morning. And Lord, we come against the mind games on those who are sick this morning. Lord, we pray, Lord God, that the enemy will no longer have a way to speak lies into our ears. Lord, that we will hear your voice and hear your truth, and see what you're even doing in the midst of this time of pain and of suffering. Be with us this morning, but bring healing to those who need healing. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You can do me a favor and bring those names back and put them in the bowls. And on your way back to your seats, let's uh, say hi to somebody that we don't know or do know. <sighs> we serve a good God, don't we? Well, good morning and welcome to First Assembly. We're so happy to see you here this morning. If you have your tithes or your offerings this morning, uh, we, ha we have the box in the back that is available for you to put your offering in this morning. And at the end of the announcements here, I will pray for that offering. We will take up a second offering later this morning for, our, for the missionaries that we have with us, the alleys. And those will be in the, um, in the offering plates that will be on the chairs. So I want you to let you know that there's going to be two places that you can get. But that one's the offering for the alleys. The other one's for your tithes for the church. So I uh, just wanted you to know that, that that's why those are there. If you've already registered for the Vital Conference, please meet at 4 p.m. at the church Friday. And be prepared to have a great time. We're going to have a blast. MOP's next meeting will be October 7th for moms of any age. And it'll meet at 6.30 and I don't see any visitors here, but if you're a visitor here or if you're a visitor at home watching us on, on Facebook, please text the word welcome to 765-300-3061 to receive important information. And if, if you are a guest and you never received your bag, please make sure you get one at the Welcome Center after service. We want to get you a gift for being here with us this morning. And please feel free to follow us on Facebook or Instagram or check our website on the events page 
for links and more details. And like I said, you have our offering in the back. And I just want to let you know that, that uh, it's an honor to be able to give to God. I'm not a big, I'm not a big guy in, in saying, give more money or whatever, but I've always shown, I've always known, noticed that God has blessed me as I've been faithful to give. I'm not a rich man by any means, but God's always made sure all my bills are paid. That's more than I can ask. So, Lord, I pray for our offering this morning. I pray you'll bless it. I pray you'll help it to go to where it needs to go in our church, in our, in our, on the mission field. Lord, use it in a way that can advance your kingdom. Bless those who gave and bless those who will give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, I would like to introduce to you our speakers this morning. It is our pr privilege to have Doug and Christy Alley with us this morning. They are missionaries serving the Philippines. I'm sure they'd rather be there than here right now, but they're happy to be with us. It's been a rough couple of years with COVID, hasn't it? Not being able to get back over there. So please welcome them and give them your full undivided attention this morning. Thank you, Pastor Matt. That's gracious of you, and uh, it's a privilege to be with you. And, you know, I, I, I do, I do wish we were back in the Philippines, but in this moment, I, I am so grateful to be here with you. Um, you know, I'll share a little bit more about some things in the Philippines right now. For uh, Since March last year, not March this year, children, um, 18 and below, it was 21 and below, but I think it's 18 at the moment, um, the children have been quarantined for their house. Um, they have not been allowed out. They have not had any face-to-face -face learning. Um, so uh, for the sake of my kids, I am grateful that they're here today. Um, it's, it's a kind of a, it, it's a catch-22. I'm, I'm torn, but at the same time, I'm grateful. Uh, the Lord has known. Um, the process all along. He's not surprised by any of this, right? I mean, at times I feel weary from it. You know, we got this COVID pandemic weariness, I think, at times. But I am so grateful that we can go to him and he refreshed us. He's refreshing us this morning. So thank you for letting us be here with you. And uh, pray for leading us in those particular songs, too. So thank you for that. Uh, we have been in the Philippines since 2015. We've been ministering overseas. And um, I am half Filipino. My mother was from the Philippines. That kind of gave me a heart for the Philippines before we went over there. Um, but while we were there, uh, we went over there as church planters and leadership development workers, a.k.a. fancy word for discipleship makers. That's what we're called to do, right? Make disciples and help others follow Christ. Um, the mercy he's given us, we share with others. And we went over there, and while we were there, we saw these children on the street. And while we saw these kids on the streets, we were like, well, why are they here? You know? And we learned, don't, don't give them money. They, they'll, they'll use it for drugs. Many of them would. Uh, many of them were there because of their own drug addiction or their parents' um, drug addiction or related issues. Uh, many of their parents were in prison because of um, drug addiction or dead. And so they started living on the streets or become part of a syndicate, often drug syndicates, and uh, that's why they were there. We were told, don't give them money, give them, you know, bring them food or something. I started carrying a, a backpack, and I, I, I would, um, many of them didn't have shoes on their feet. If they didn't have shoes that protected them from the, the, their feet, they would uh, contract worms. Many of them would, you know, you could get brain damage or you could die even. Um, so we would provide sandals. We tried to meet human needs and made that contact, and we realized, uh, but, man, we need to do more. Okay, I get it. We don't give them money. You know, they're, they're not showing us, they're, they're not coming with us, they're not showing us where they're staying to bring more food and more needs. You know, what, what about things like Teen Challenge? Many of you might be familiar with Teen Challenge. Um, is there a Teen Challenge here? And they're like, well, we've tried to start Teen Challenge in the Philippines, but it's, it's failed twice. Um, yeah, there's people that have been connected, but there's no Teen Challenge in the Philippines. Um, there, 
There's one that kind of went rogue. The guy didn't submit to leadership. He's got a center, but it's not really a team challenge because that's what the global team does. It's doing its own thing. Um, there are some ministries, but the church wasn't doing much. And we, so we asked our fellowship, can we do something else? And that's when the door finally opened for us to partner with Global Team Challenge to help meet this need. So I, I uh, see some grandparents in this crowd, and I want to talk to you this morning. You see, um, Team Challenge is important to my heart because I have a father who was an alcoholic, and his two brothers were alcoholics. And when I was in third grade, my uncle David was killed in an automobile accident because he was drunk. My grandmother, however, was a prayer warrior. She never stopped praying for her sons, for me, for her other grandchildren. Until the day she died, she continued to pray. And I believe that it's the power of her prayers that brought my father to Christ and his older brother to Christ. It's the power of prayer that brought me out of of many bad situations that could have been worse. You see, God really protected me from a lot of things that other members of my family went through. And it's because I had a grandmother who never stopped praying. Yes, we go and serve in the Philippines, but I venture to guess guess if I asked you to raise your hand, and I'm not going to, but if I asked you to raise your hand to see if drugs or alcohol had affected anybody in here, I bet a lot of hands would be raised. I bet you know someone in your family or in your workplace who who has a son or a daughter or they themselves are battling addiction. We, we all probably don't need to search too far into our family to see that that's touched our own families. Will you be people of prayer? I love that you, you took time to pray for names. And maybe some of those names that you are praying for we're battling addiction. And I want you to know that when all hope seems lost, that we have a God that is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. So let's not surrender hope. Let's continue to persevere in hope and to be a people who will pray. So our partnership with Global Teen Challenge in the Philippines allows us to come alongside the church um, we have a residential men's center that actually opened up while we've been gone. Um, I have a, a, a ministry partner in the Philippines. He's Canadian. He married a Filipino, so he was able to stay. If you're married to a, a Filipino citizen, you um, are able to, to be in the Philippines right now during the pandemic, and they've opened a men's center. Um, they have had, had, had good success in those men come to the Lord and surrender some of their issues and find healing. Um, they've had father wounds, um, but uh, the Lord is healing them and doing an amazing work in their lives. While I was in the Philippines in our last assignment, there was um, most of my work was training the church on how to come alongside others that have addiction issues. Um, Teen Challenge recognizes that 90% of people will never, never enter a residential program to find help for their addiction, 90%. So we try to train the church and equip the church to come alongside people um, just to meet their needs and walk with them there. And while I was in the Philippines, I, I received an email one day. There was a mother in, the Phil- in, in America, her son, who was in his 50s, had come to the Philippines and married a Filipina. And soon after they got married, he got back into his alcohol addiction. He'd been an alcoholic since uh, teenage, teenage years. He got into uh, the Marines, and that was his lifelong addiction, battling alcohol. Um, he would sneak out at night and, and get alcohol and just he'd be passed out all day long the next day. Um, his, his, 
because the wife ended up emailing me and said, my husband can't even get out of the bed to go to the bathroom. He really has some serious issues. Can you help him? So finally, it was arranged. I met him one day in, in Manila over some french fries, and he was shaking. He had uh, sobered up to be with me, but he had some major withdrawals going on that day. He's like, Doug, Doug, I've been here for, for, uh, for seven years now. I came here on a tourist visa. A tourist visa allowed you at the time to be there for one year. He's like, I never got my visa renewed. I, I feel like I'm in trouble by the law, and, uh, you know, and I just want to get back to America. I think I can stay with my mom and dad. Um, can you help me get home to America? So at this, at this time, he didn't want help with his addiction. He didn't want the Lord. He just wanted to get back to America. I'm like, David, I, you know, I, I, we work with an organization that can help us with visa stuff. I think we can help you, but I am concerned. If you go back to America now, and um, if your plan is to stay with your parents who, um, you know, you, you kind of have had issues with in the past too, I'm concerned that you'll relapse. And David, I'm honest, you're in your 50s. I'm scared you'll die if you go now to America. I, I, I think, you know, and even if uh, you, you did get a visa here that, that you may get in trouble and be placed in prison where you won't get help too and you could die. David, I think first thing we need to try to get you some help. And uh, he agreed. We we had um, some European missionary friends that had a had a, a residential program, discipleship program. We were able to get him in. He agreed to go. Took three months. And he actually found the Lord. We have a, a, a brother in Christ named David today because you know he was willing to go and take that step of faith to to go and get help. I'm convinced that the reason why David was able to go and get that help was because he had a praying mom. He had a praying dad. He had praying family that had been praying for him for years. You know, they say the older you get, the, the harder it is to make that choice to overcome an addiction or find Jesus Christ. Well, except for the prayers of others, they get answered by the Lord. And Jesus Christ made a difference in David's life. You know, that praying mom had a huge help. Praying mom, praying grandma, praying dad, uncles, cousins, you play a huge part in that salvation for someone else. Uh, David called me while I'd been back in the States. He said, Doug, Doug, hey, I'm, I'm here in Pennsylvania. I'm going to um, um, a, a second step program here to get more help and to, to grow in the Lord. And David is serving the Lord today. Today, David um, is working for a Christian businessman who's um, trying to make money to petition for his wife to one day be with him, and he's serving the Lord. Today, we all know someone, right, who is in a similar situation. You know, and maybe it's, maybe it's not alcohol or drugs. You know, it could be pornography. It could be just anxiety or depression or, or grief. Um, everyone we know right now, we are at a state in the world where people are hurting. And we have something. We have something that's greater than the vaccine right now for COVID. We've got the gospel. We've got the hope that we can share it with someone. Um, and, and everyone in here, you have a role to play in that. You have a story to share with someone else because you're here and you have mercy in your pockets. Um, you know, if Adam's back there, I think I've got a short video I'd like to show you before I get into the Word this morning. So let's see if we can go ahead and show that if we'll come up. Everyone has a story to tell. Your story might be about happiness with a little bit of goofiness. Your story might be about friendships and family. Your story might have pain in it and even death. Your story might be about perseverance or redemption. Your story might be about love and a lot of it. You see, everyone has a story to tell. And if you were to ask me to tell you the story of Global Teen Challenge in one word, I would tell you that it is a story of hope. In fact, I would say that the story of Global Teen Challenge is about putting hope within reach of those who have lost sight of their own story. Stories that have been lost, stolen, forgotten, and even destroyed by a plague called addiction. A plague so deadly that it kills seven people every minute an epidemic so vast that 270 million people are struggling with it worldwide. 
but their story is not finished yet. Global Teen Challenge is a worldwide network committed to reaching the most hopeless of addicts and provides the hope and help they need to overcome addiction. With over 1,400 locations across 125 nations, Global Teen Challenge is putting hope within reach of thousands of lives every day, and it's because of people like you who choose to give. Because every time you give, your gift goes to those who thought their story had come to an end and never imagined they'd feel hope again. Global Teen Challenge has a dream, to bring hope and transformation to the stories that need it most. Only you, only I, only we can put hope within reach. Um, thank you for that. Guys, we, we all have a story, and there's, there's people out there who have a story that uh, they may not look like they're invited to come alongside them right now. You know, when you see them, they, they may not make it easy for you to come alongside them. But aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Christ gave you that invitation. You know, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he, he talks about all you who are weary and heavy laden. He said, come to me and I'll give you rest. Aren't you glad that maybe when you weren't making it look easy, Christ still chose to die on a cross for you? I wasn't very lovely in my sin. I was a mess. You know, I don't need to get too into that this morning, I think, to make the point that, that I've gotten a lot of mercy. I mean, I've got a beautiful wife that shows right there, right? I've got a lot of, a lot of mercy, right? Um, mercy. You know, someone told me soon after I came back to the Lord that, you know, you know, God has put mercy in your pockets, and 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 He does it again every morning because He wants you to spend it every day. Every morning He gives you new mercy, as Word tells us, and He wants you to spend it on others. You know, in the, the Philippines, I, I can speak about the Philippines because I'm familiar with it a little bit. Like I said, children have not been allowed out of their house since March last year. and um, They're estimating 25% have had zero education over this time frame. Zero education. That's going to affect that nation for, for a generation. I've, I follow the news about Lebanon where they have lost 90% of their currency's value. That will affect them for a generation. Um, hopefully the Lord's coming back soon, but if, if he doesn't, well, then he's placed us and he's positioned us for, for a purpose here in America, right now, at this hour, for, for the needs around the world. Um, before I jump into scripture, I'm going to take another moment just to pray. And God, I thank you for the privilege to be here with these people. And I thank you to God for all that they are already doing for the gospel and for your kingdom. I thank you for them. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help me to encourage them and strengthen them today. God, there is, there is yet an unfinished task, and it does spread around the world. God, God we want to have a part in it. God, we, we place ourselves here at your altar, and we say, God, whatever you want to do, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to share just a couple of passages because I want to be sensitive to what I believe um, was taking place during worship today. Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. But you do know that the Lord will destroy this world by fire one day because it's, it's prophesied in Scripture. But notice his heart to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. That is a desire that God has. Ezekiel. Um, turn to this real quick here. Ezekiel chapter 22. Verse 30, and I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. 
kind of looking. And that I believe you guys have been positioning yourself. You've been here. You've been you've been trying to hold things down. You've been trying to move forward. You've been trying to 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 walk through the season of pandemic. You've been trying to walk through the the political world that we live in now. You've been trying to recognize that we don't wrestle with just flesh and blood, but there are spiritual things that are taking place here too. God, help us to see clearly what you are trying to do in the world today. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is um, Nehemiah. Um, I, I identify a lot with this guy, Nehemiah. He was serving, he was cupbearer to the king, and as the cupbearer of the king, he was positioned, right? He was positioned in a place to, to have this relationship with the king and, and know the king and have an ear with the king. And he was also um, not, not a Babylonian. He was, he was not in his country of his ancestry. Now, I identify with that because I, I did not grow up in the Philippines. Okay? And I grew up in Iowa. Uh, my my mom, she told me the story that when she was a young girl growing up in the Philippines, she knew that there was a God. She grew up hearing about God, but she didn't know how to have a relationship with God. And then she came to America. She married my dad in the 60s. Uh, my dad joined a pen pal club before internet dating and met my mom, and they, they, they got married. But my dad said, well, if you come here, you know, I, I'm, I'm a divorce. I'm a divorcee, and if you come here, I go to a, to a little assembly God church here in, in Iowa. And, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? He's like, well, you know what? Your church will be my church, and your God will be my God, kind of like you from Naomi. And she came to this little church, and through the relationship with others in the church, she got to know the love of Jesus Christ. She got to learn that I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ because of the body of Christ coming alongside this immigrant coming to America. She passed away in 2013. That thought occurred to me. What if she'd never come to America? The question occurred to me. Why did she have to come halfway around the world to know Jesus Christ? Um, later that year, there was a, a disaster in the Philippines, Typhoon Yolanda. I don't know if you remember anything about the name of Typhoon Yolanda. It has been one of the worst um, wind storms uh, of, of our generation, 200 and some mile per hour winds ripping across the southern part of the Philippines where my mom had grown up. And I got in contact with Convoy of Hope that does disaster relief. They actually call the Philippines the, the, the disaster and catastrophe capital of the world, actually, because of all the typhoons, because they're on the ring of fire, because of different things that take place in the Philippines. And they said, man, we could use a team. Yeah, if you want to come with us and help uh, minister to needs. And, and then at the last second, they said, no, we got it covered. Thank you for that. Thank you for your willingness to go. And I remember being crushed. Man, I want to go help. I want to go do something. And I remember talking to, to Pastor Walt Weaver and Anderson, actually, at the time. I said, man, Pastor Walt, this is where I am. He said, well, Doug, you know, you did just lose your mom. You know, you got a lot going on. I, you should probably be depressed right now. I'm, I get that you're frustrated. And, and he said, but, but maybe God hasn't called you for something short term. Maybe there's something long term that you need to go and do over there. And here we are, um, we preparing to return to the Philippines, now partnering with Global Teen Challenge, and just looking to meet needs. And Nehemiah, that's where he was. He heard about the disaster in his home country. He heard that the walls were broken down, and that left the city defenseless. That left the city without hope and, and, and in need of help and repair and defense. And Jerusalem was his home that he'd never been to yet, that he knew he loved, that he knew he was even prophesied that, that they, they would go back, right? Nehemiah. So in chapter 4, we, we pick up on after Nehemiah was commissioned by the king to go back. He actually got commissioned by the king to go back. And in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, I'm going to pick up here in the story. It says, Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. He said in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they, they revive the stones out of the heap of rubbish and burn ones at that? 
Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. So here we, we read that, that Nehemiah has gotten back to, to Jerusalem. He's, he's in, in the process of building this wall, and the neighbors, the neighbors are mad. The neighbors are looking out their window and saying, hey, what do they think they did? Who do they think they are? They rallied against them. You know what? As the church moves forward, the, the, the world is not going to say, hey, way to go, church. You're doing a good thing. Oh, way to go. We're so glad that you're in the Philippines to help us with our, our drug culture. Oh, we're so glad that you're here to make a difference in the community. The world's not going to get happy with the church in the last of the last days. People within the church, some of them won't be happy with what they see in the last of the last days. It's good for us. What we read here is is um, they they got mocked. They got they had they had the God mockers after them, and we we see it today, right? We've seen it today in the Philippines. Some of this last year with that pandemic, suicide among children has increased. And at first, the government actually made a statement saying, "Hey, it it is the hour where if you happen to know um, someone who's battling." Um, with, with depression, um, please encourage them to, to go to church. Church, please try to meet needs of our neighbors and our communities. The very next day, the media got on and said um, the mental health professionals have decreed that the church is wrong, that the church is not the first responder for many of the needs, that it, it should be the mental health professionals. The church is already being knocked down a few pedestals to, to say, hey, if, if it's not your job, it's, it's the mental health professional. You know what? And there is a place for, for counseling. There is a place for, for professional help. I, I battle with anxiety like many others do these days. You know, and I, I'm not saying that there's not a place for counseling or assistance with that. What I'm saying is there is power in the gospel to set free and give hope where there is no hope. I spent 12 years working in a residential place for troubled teens close by, Muncie, Indiana. And, and I, I'm bringing this up today for, for another reason. I'll be honest, Pastor Matt, when you said you had the whole message in, in preparation for this, I was very distracted, not because I don't want to present the word, but because I was thinking about my time at the Youth Opportunity Center. You see, there were, there were, there were many kids that I got to work with, teenagers, placed at the YOC, they're, pla- they're court appointed to be there, and it's, I, I work in what they call the task facility, okay? Treatment of adolescent secure care. So we had some of the, 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 the severe and the severe in our care. Our center was kind of like the last bus stop before a juvenile detention center like Pendleton or um, a state or mental hospital. We were the last stop for young people to to maybe get some therapeutic care and therapeutic help. We gave them maybe some help, but we didn't give them the hope of the gospel that only Jesus Christ can give while I worked there. There were some, though, there were some that that, that I knew, that they, they shared their story while I was there. There were a couple in particular that stood out to me in preparation and coming here today. I couldn't help but think about them. They were from Newcastle. They were from Newcastle, Indiana. You guys know where that is today? Raise your hand if you know where Newcastle is today. All right. That's good. We're all still awake today. Me too. So Newcastle, Indiana, and they came from evangelical church fellowships. Now, okay, they, they weren't your church fellowship. Okay, I'm not going to throw whoever it was on the bus. But they came from evangelical church fellowships. They came from Christian homes. Now, one thing that I – to the best of my memory here, they didn't come from homes that had their biological dad in the house. But they came from Christian homes. And, and they, they, they had Christian moms that, that loved them, that were, I, to my understanding, pretty solid in the church, prayed together in the church. And 
I, I, I try to in, in encourage those guys while they were there because we, we shared something. You know, we shared a faith. They weren't walking away from their, their faith while they were there. They, they still knew the scriptures while they were there. And, still, and, and to a degree, they, they, they wanted it. They, they, they wanted the gospel. They wanted that relationship with Christ. So they wanted to see something different. Now, they struggled. They wrestled. We all struggle. We all wrestle, right? But I had the privilege to come alongside them. That's basically what I believe that Christ calls us to do is to, to come alongside others and, and encourage them wherever they are in their faith. I, I believe there's, there's that many. I, I believe we're positioned for a purpose for an hour to do something. I look at, it, at David's life, and he said, my life is but a few handbrakes. God, teach me to number my days. Teach me to know what to do with what I've got. You know, uh, Pastor Matt, you shared a little bit with me. I don't know how much you've announced, um, but, but I, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. I, I, I know that your church has been uh, looking at, at youth ministry and um, uh, a youth pastor. I want to encourage you. God is preparing you for one, okay? God is preparing you for something, but maybe in the preparation process, maybe there's something inside you that has to be ready for what's to come too. You know, what, what is God going to do in your life, in your heart? Because when God does bring you a youth worker, it's not just their job to go out and love that young person in, in Newcastle. It's not just their job. You know, today I hope that we can see something, and I hope I can explain this good enough, because I don't always understand it either. When a missionary comes and shares our story, you know, what we're doing, um, what you've done with the Johnsons and other missionaries, the, the chaplains, what you've done is somehow God has a fishing net going on all around the world. Okay? It's, a, it's a big human fishing net where, where we're trying to catch souls together. And what we're doing is we're pulling this net in together. And, and what we're, we're, we're trying to do is we're just trying to, trying to love people right where they are to know the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. You know, it's later on in this passage of chapter 4, Nehemiah says, you know, we're building this wall, and there's going to be low points in this wall. And I'm going to blow a trumpet. I'm going to blow a trumpet. And when I blow that trumpet, I want you to run to that low point in the wall and help me defend it against the enemy. Okay, when a missionary comes or when your pastor calls you to prayer, we're blowing a trumpet because there's low points in the wall. And, and your prayer and your love need to go to that place to help stand in that gap, to help make a difference right in that low point in the wall because we need you, you, we need you to work. We need you to do something. You know, maybe, maybe you're weary today. I get that too because we all have gotten weary at different times over the last several months. Missionaries have gotten weary. Pastors have gotten weary. You have gotten weary, right? We've all gotten weary at different times, even more so. When the trumpet gets called, we need your help too. We need your help. When we come and we ask you to, to pray or, or, or to give, we're, we're asking you to, to, to throw in some work in, in, into that, that low point in the wall to stand in the gap, to, to, to make the difference. You know, I, 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 I don't go back to the Philippines without people giving. It's true. It's true. It's true. I, if people don't give, if people don't pray. But today, I also recognize, as much as I want you to, to hear about these kids in the Philippines, the Philippines now leads the world in cyber trafficking. Parents, siblings, selling selling their own family members online because they don't have enough money for food. My kids don't go a day without being able to eat three or four times a day. Yeah, I do want you to know about those needs. But regardless of if you remember to give, to pray, I also know that there are young people in Newcastle, Indiana, who needs you too. And if God brings you a youth pastor, it's not just their job. God's, God's commissioned you. Today, you are commissioned, okay? Today, you are commissioned to do something in the meantime to love people in your, in your community. 
Like, that's not easy. You know, just the other day, I was walking with our, our dog. We brought our dog from the Philippines, and uh, I, I saw a neighbor, and I happen to know that he's not serving the Lord. I happen to know that they're, they're, they're in, in, in a conundrum of life right now. And I saw him go get the mail. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get alongside the other side of his house. I want to talk to him. I want to stir up a relationship and talk to him and visit with him a little bit more. And when I got to the other side of the house, he wasn't there. There are these moments. You know, I wish I would have caught him ahead of time. The moment that God gives you to do something, it's your chance to say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it now. Holy Spirit, help us. God has blessed us as Pentecostal people. I, I love Greg Mundus. He's our world missions director at the AG. He said one time, he said, perhaps, perhaps we're Pentecostal people, not because there's something special about us as far as uh, our abilities, but perhaps it's because we are the most needy of people that, that just need a special touch of the Lord to help us to do what we do. Today, perhaps we need that special touch of the Holy Spirit to help us to do what we do. If that's you today, um, I'm going to pass this back to Pastor Matt. I'm not sure how he would like to, to close out this time, but I'm okay if you wanted to give a couple more minutes to the altar too. Um, yeah. What a word, huh? What an encouragement. What a challenge. We live in a county in a community that needs Jesus. I love how he said that when we call, call, get called to prayer, to stand in the gap. You know, in that story in Nehemiah, which always stuck out to me, is they used just normal items as, as weapons. They picked up whatever they could to fight with. Which tells me is we don't need to be very polished in our prayers. We don't need to be very polished in, in how we go after people for Jesus and how we present Jesus in our lives. We just need to do it. And so I want us I don't want to talk too much longer. I I, I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Two Wednesdays ago we had a word come to us that we need to respond. And God tells us to respond. We don't need to wait for somebody else. We don't have a specific altar call, but we do. What I do want us to do is I want to open up the altars. And if you feel like God is stirring your heart for something, for anything, I want you to come to the altars and seek God's face. I do want to share one story that just came on mind before we move forward. I remember one time I was preaching a message to our youth in, in Evansville. And we had, we had a good altar time. And I was praying with some kids, and I was like, so what do you want to pray for? He's like, well, remember when you said this thing, this is what God, what he shared. I, I never even mentioned it in my message. But the Holy Spirit dropped it in his heart. And that's what he heard. That's what he was responding to. So you might be responding to one thing, and they might be responding to another. But we need to respond to what the Holy Spirit is challenging us to respond to this morning. So I'm going to open the altars. I'll be here to pray with you. we got plenty of time. We're in no hurry this morning. Let's seek God's peace. The altars are open. Let's everybody go ahead and stand. Let's make it a little bit easier on each other. Lord, whatever you're speaking to us this morning, whatever you're speaking to us this morning, help us to respond in the way we need to respond. Maybe God has placed somebody on your heart that you just need to come to the altar and cry out to God. Maybe there's an area or an issue in your life that God is 
challenged you. He has pointed it out in your spirit. And you need to come to the altar and submit it to him. Maybe you just feel drawn. You don't know what you need to pray for. You just know you know you need to get to the altar. Spirit is in this place. Don't miss out on what he's doing right now. Is, sorry, if there is someone at the altar that you feel like you need to go pray with them, I want to invite you to come and pray with those who are praying. If you feel led, if you feel like I need to go pray, come on. Come on, let's pray for each other this morning. Let's learn to carry each other's burdens. Come alongside each other.
And we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, I feel like we're on the t- we're on the we're on the razor's edge. We're on the tipping point of it as a church. We sense you're doing a new thing every week. And Lord, I pray that you prepare our hearts for what you have in store for us. What you're going to do in our midst and in our lives. Prepare our hearts for what you want to do in our own lives. Join with me in prayer. I didn't know when I was gonna when this was gonna be a good time to announce this, but Adam and Emily just they uh, they just they decided that they felt like they they were being called in a different direction, and so they won't be coming here and joining us. So we don't know why God does what He does. We got a good word from Him last week, so I'm happy that we at least were challenged by His message last week. But let's continue to pray for the direction that God has for our church. I'm confident that he's got somebody that will join me on st- me and Kay on staff that will help get our church, but you know, where it needs to go. But you know, it all doesn't depend on one worker. Like you said, we all need to work for it. We all need to work together. Many hands make the work light. So join with me in prayer in the next few months as we start over on the search that God will bring the right person for our church, for us, for our teenagers that will love the teenagers of this city and of this county. I, I, I covet your prayers. By the way, it was nothing to do with our church that they didn't like. They loved our church. It was just other issues. So I can't go into it. And I don't want to go into it. So, but they, he enjoyed his time here with us. So I want you guys to be aware of that. I didn't want you guys to. I don't want any rumors. So that's why I announced it from the front. So, all right. Let's pray for the alleys. If you can extend your hand to the alleys as they prepare as they continue to to preach and just prepare to go back to the Philippines when God will open the door for them to go. Let's pray God's blessing on them, that God will give them fresh strength, new energy. Lord, we lift up the alleys right now to you, Father. Lord, you see and you know what's going on. We don't even understand. We don't even know what's, what tomorrow brings, but you do. And Lord, I pray for the alleys right now, Lord God, that you will bless them financially, spiritually, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you will give them many, many, many divine appointments while still here in the States, Lord God. And we pray, Lord God, that you will open up doors for them to get back to the Philippines and to do the work that you've called them to do. Lord, I pray for your hand upon them, Lord God. Fill them up with the fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we, we invite you to fill them up today. Be with, <coughs> excuse me, be with their kids, their son and their daughter. Be with them in this season as well. Help them to find friends that will be lifelong friends, even though they're going to be in the Philippines, lifelong friends here in the States. Be with them today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I bless you guys in the name of Jesus today. And in case you're curious, I know I cough some. I don't have COVID. I know this for a fact. I took a test. Okay. Just wanted you guys to be aware. Don't want there to be any rumors about that either. So, all right. Love you guys. Have a great week. Also, really quick, if we can get a few people to help us, we need to pull some tables out in the gym. We have a funeral here on Tuesday. We need at least 10 round tables out in the gym, and, uh, and so that would be great if you could help me with that really quick before you leave.